Well, hello everyone, and welcome back to Adrian's Digital Basement. On today's video, it's gonna be another entry in the PC Archaeology series. It seemed that people generally enjoyed that series, so let's do another entry. On today's video, we have this Compact Persario 425, which we're gonna take a look at. So without further ado, let's get right to it. So the Compact Persario 425. Now what you can tell right off the bat is that this is an all-in-one computer. And one thing I kind of like about it is that it's not that much bigger than just a normal 14 inch VGA monitor of the time. Someone local here in Portland gave this machine to me and I haven't turned it on and I actually know very little about it. I remember seeing these back in the day and I really kind of dug the overall form factor of this thing. It just it's quite compact. I mean, VGA monitors themselves are pretty large, but the fact is that the computer portion of this really only is this small area at the bottom, which could easily have just been the tilt swivel stand of a monitor of this size. Looking again at the front, there's not a whole lot going on here. We have a power switch, which I assume controls both the monitor and the computer, three and a half inch disk drive. We have a power LED, hard drive LED. And under here, we have three knobs, contrast, brightness, and looks like horizontal position. Let's rotate this thing around and take a look at the back. Zooming into the label here, right here is a manufacture date, 1993, November. So this thing is pretty early on when it comes to all-in-ones. Assembly number 160643-001, whatever that means. And over here, wide range input. How fancy. 100 volts to 120, 220 to 240. So you could use this thing anywhere in the world, just simply by plugging it in. And this was made by the old Compaq. I'm pretty sure this was the old Compaq before it was part of HP. So this is the real deal. This is the Compaq that made the first PC clone, the Compaq Portable. So most like this thing, it's built like a tank. And down here we have the computer module, I guess we could call it. We have two PS2 ports for mouse and keyboard, serial, parallel, a joystick port, and a built-in modem. And there are two slots here, which are almost certainly 100% they're gonna be ISA slots. And you might notice that where's the power connector on here? Where's the IEC input jack? It's actually right here. So the power cable, if I take this one right here, would plug in like so, that way it doesn't stick out so you can place the monitor or the entire computer that is up against your wall and it's not gonna interfere. I also notice here that there is what looks like a handle here and pretty sure you just take off these two Torx screws here and you can probably slide the entire compute module out, which we'll do in just a second. Not much else to report on this thing. It's in pretty good cosmetic shape. There's a little bit of a bump up here that it suffered at some point. It has a little bit of yellowing. You can see the difference between this lower part of the screen bezel and the rest of the front. So this would have been more like the original color, a little bit of a lighter, creamy beige. But ultimately, because this was a beige computer to start with, it doesn't look too far off from the way it was originally. So I think it's time to pull this board out, make sure there's no battery leakage here. And once we pull this motherboard out and take a look, I'll power it up and we'll see if this thing works. I just about want to take these two screws out with my Phillips screwdriver. And yeah, I just said these were Torx bits. If you ever worked on compacts in the 80s and into the 90s, they used Torx screws everywhere. I don't know if this was like ease of manufacturing or perhaps a little bit of a deterrence for people to go inside their computer. But even up here, I can see the screws holding the monitor together are also Torx bits, which is a little unusual because pretty much every monitor I've ever worked on, it just had Phillips screws holding the back cover on. Now, Compact did not use security bits. So you just need a standard Torx screwdriver bit or whatever to get them off. No issue there, but it is just a little bit of a, a roadblock. If you are a standard home computer user and you have a toolbox with just a few tools in it, you're probably not likely gonna have a Torx screwdriver set. Anyhow, okay, these two screws are out. I think that is it. Let's try pulling the handle. Look at that. It slides out. Such amazing modularity, I gotta say. Let's slide this out and take a look. 
Before we take a look at the motherboard just slid out, I see that this bottom piece here is plastic and sitting on top of the towel, it's causing it to flex a little bit. So I'm just gonna put that like so, and then we'll slide the monitor out of the way. What a freaking neat little package we have going on here. So there's the Intel 46SX. Let me see if I can read the clock speed. 25 megahertz, so basically just as I, as I read online. And we have right here the socket for the Intel 487DX, I think it was called. I'm gonna have to do a little bit of reading to see if I can just stick a normal 46 in there, like say a 46DX250. Can that just go in this socket and it work? Like it will disable this onboard processor, which is obviously surface mount and soldered. I will have to look that up. I think it's the same number of pins, except there were one extra pin on this processor, I think. Ugh, you know, I'm gonna have to do a little bit of reading. I just don't recall off the top of my head. Anyhow, we do see that we have onboard RAM here, and I recall reading it was four megabytes of onboard memory, but look, two memory slots, 72 pin. So clearly we can do some type of RAM upgrade on here, which is fantastic. Take a look at this right next to the CPU. There's a little face drawn on the motherboard, obviously by the designers. It looks like there's actually a jumper right here to select between 25 and 33 megahertz. So I assume if I can get 46DX2 in here, like a six, uh, I can put a 66 megahertz one in there if I can switch this to 33 megahertz. This area of the board over here is clearly for the modem, which is not really needed any longer, but we have a Rockwell chipset here. On the riser card of the two ISA slots, we have copyright 1993 compact. And sure enough, checking the date codes on the various chips, like here's the VLSI chipset, it's got 1993 38th week. So that's clearly when this board is from around. And that coincides exactly with the date that was on the back of the monitor cover. Cool. It's a little hard to see, but down here under the disk drive is a Sirius Logic video chip, and that is clearly what generates the VGA signal that feeds into the monitor. And notice there's no cable connection on here. And that's because if I turn this here, there's a slot connector and that obviously plugs in inside the monitor chassis to send the signals to the CRT that's in there. On the front of this chassis here is the speaker that obviously shoots through the front of the case, I guess. Although there certainly aren't very many holes here to let the sound out. We have a regular compact disc drive, which probably works. It probably has a little bit of dust inside there. It's made by Mitsubishi, I can see the label on the top there. And we have a Seagate IDE hard drive, compact labeled, of course, but how big is this? 214 megabytes. So hopefully this still works. We can see if there's any interesting software on this machine. And with this computer, I was concerned that there was a potential battery problem, but I'm looking under there and you can just see it by those wires there. See that? There's a coin cell and it is the solder type, unfortunately. So we'll need to take this apart if the computer works, that is, and replace that with a CR2032 coin holder and a new battery, the computer will work fine with that as it is, but it will be nice to actually get a battery in here that works so it can keep the CMOS settings. But the fact that it's regular ID is excellent because I can obviously replace this with a compact flash card. For an early all-in-one from 1993, they were really thinking ahead here. I can easily add a sound card and a SCSI card, for instance, so we can run an external CD-ROM drive and have full sound capability and the joystick ports already on the motherboard, although hopefully there's a way to disable that perhaps with a jumper or whatnot. And one other thing I'm noticing that's excellent about something that's from this time period is unlike Macintosh machines from the exact era this was from, 1993 or thereabouts, this does not have capacitor plague. It's got one electrolytic here and every other cap I see on the board is a tantalum, which can short, but they don't leak. So in case I need to replace one, it's not gonna be a problem and this won't have any corrosion. It just means that these machines are probably extra reliable. I wanted to just take a look in here and check out the back plane, or not really a back plane. There's the connector that connects to the monitor and there is a gray cable that goes up to the upper area of the monitor and it is a standard VGA cable. So clearly that's just probably a cut cable from the very stock monitor, compact probably sold a monitor that was exactly like this with the same guts in it. Although, what am I saying? Because this also does power the computer. So five and 12 volts comes out of this top part of the monitor and comes down to that little edge connector to power up this chassis. So I guess there's a little bit of a difference there compared to the standard fare. But it is interesting, you know, compactist would probably use the most commodity parts they could in designing this inexpensive and consumer oriented 
all in one machine. So this just slides right in with no issues at all. I think it's getting caught up on the, the uh, towel. Yep, it was. <laughs> so I need to tilt this up, I guess, make sure that doesn't happen. There we go. It's now time to power this up. Let's just check that this is off. Yep, you can tell the switch actually is in when it's on, out when it's off. So I'm gonna plug this in and we're gonna see how it goes. Unlike a Macintosh, there's not gonna be a friendly chime. There probably won't even be a beep. It will power on, do a memory check, and then give us a beep. It would have been nice if PCs had a little bit nicer of a startup sound, but I guess it is what it is, right? Okay, here we go. Are we gonna get fire? Are we gonna get sparks? Are we gonna get smoke? Or are we gonna have a working computer? Hey, look at that. We have high voltage. The monitor has powered up. Hear the hard drive spinning. I don't know about these knobs. Oh, oh yes, we have a display. Oh, this is so cool. Let's see, turn it down. Okay, keyboard or system unit error. It's working. I turned off the extra light there. I gotta say, this looks incredibly sharp and really bright. That is nice. Judging by really how little dust there was, in here. Although, was there even a fan? There, there's no fan in this thing. So no wonder why it wasn't dusty. I was about to say there wasn't a lot of dust in here, but that's really because there's no fan. Although there's a little bit of air coming out of the top of the monitor. So clearly there's a fan in the monitor section, I guess, and it must draw air in the sides and up through the monitor because on the top here, I feel a little bit of air coming out of there. Okay, so <laughs> that explains that. But really the, the lack of dust in here, this computer must not have been used very much which explains why the CRT is incredibly sharp. Time to get a keyboard so I can get past this message. All right, let's just go into the setup first. Let's check a look at what's going on in there. Oh, okay, okay, so let's check out. Oh yes, I can move this side to side, excellent. Sorry about the flicker, it's because uh, this is running at 70 hertz and the camera's set to 60 and I have no setting for 70. So there's no way for me to synchronize this camera to this monitor. <laughs> Kind of nice, compact. We have English, Deutsch, Espanol, and Francais. We have four languages available to us. Pretty basic BIOS. Wait a second. Tell me that the battery's not actually working. Sorry about the flicker, but this actually has a date of 2007. And if the battery were empty and the reset and the BIOS was reset, there's no way it would have that date. So I suppose <laughs> this is actually keeping the time. Numeric coprocessor not installed. And that's right, because the 46SX is a crappy, cheapened version of the 46 that has the math coprocessor probably just disabled internally. Like maybe it was a faulty die when they made it and they just cheapened it by burning some fuses that disabled it for good and then they sold it as an SX. 1.44 meg floppy drive, of course, and it's gonna boot from it or not. So that's kind of nice. You can basically make it where your C drive is the priority. So if you leave a disk in there, you don't get the no operating system found message. Fixed disk controller, type 51. Okay, well that's good to remember if the battery does die when I change it. And then as we saw at the boot screen, we have four megs of RAM as we saw. I keep scrolling down, numlock, password, game port. Thank you whoever had this computer for not setting a password. Of course I could have just reset it with a jumper, but. And then we have serial ports. We have the external port and we have the internal modem, parallel interface, power up speed is controllable and primary monitor attached to VGA. So I suppose maybe there's a way to have an external thing. Can I actually edit these settings? It says configure down here, F4. All right, what do we got here to configure? So serial, okay, so I can disable the serial port. I can disable the internal modem. Might as well do that since I'm never gonna use that. Parallel port, power up speed is auto or high, okay. VGA RAM bus width. Eight or 16 bits. Why would I ever want eight bits for the internal VGA? That's a weird option. Audio settings. Audio settings? There's no audio. Wait, what? No, I'm just gonna disable this. I saw on the motherboard when I had it out there, there was like a pin header there that was unpopulated. I had a whole bunch of pins available. And I wonder if there was a little daughter card that plugged into that that gave you audio. It's gotta be that because this stuff doesn't really make sense. And what are these weird base IOs? Yeah, so must have been some kind of compact thing. All right, audio settings, that's all disabled as we just configured. Uh, serial number if anyone's interested in. 
And the system ROM is version C1, whatever that is, from August 25th, 1993. And there's the VGA BIOS. We have a Cirrus, as I pointed out before. And lastly, it shows here that there's something in the option ROM. I'm not, not sure what that is. Notice there's no options for shadowing or anything like that. I assume that's just enabled by default on this BIOS. It's just not configurable from an end user perspective. Has an option for F7 print. Like you can print your options out. Might be helpful to be honest if you're doing a support call with someone, print that and you get on the phone call with them and it has your cell number there and other settings or whatever. Anyhow, okay, so we're gonna hit F3 to exit and we're gonna say save changes. All right, the question is, will this Compact Presario 425 boot into whatever OS is on this thing? Let's see. All sounds normal so far. We have a flashing cursor there. Is that a Compact thing? I'm not super familiar with these Compacts. I didn't have one. Hey, we got starting MS-DOS. This would have been of the era, right, where Windows 95 would be pretty slow on here. And yeah, there we go, Windows 3.1 and it's Compact branded. Super cool. Windows 3.1 would perform quite well on this machine, especially if it's running the correct video drivers to use the Cirrus logic cards for high color and high refresh rates. And it definitely looks like it's running in 256 colors here. So it does have the video drivers installed. Performance would be quite good. Windows 95 on the other hand with a 25 megahertz 46, not so great. Wow, what tab works. I should have plugged a mouse in, right? Because I can't interact with this right now. Let's just uh, exit out of this. This will end your Windows session. So that's actually, there's no program manager. That is like the program manager it replaced it. I am gonna plug in this purple Sony Vio PS2 mouse here. Kind of like it because it just has a short cord. You're not fumbling around with extra length. All right, I've locked the focus on the camera. Hopefully it's not hunting anymore because I know it does that sometimes when I film CRTs. So I rebooted the computer with the mouse connected. Hopefully the mouse is working and it is. Oh, it's very, very fast. Whoever was using this loved a fast mouse. I apologize for any more patterns you're probably seeing as well. And that's because the shadow mask on the CRT is kind of interfering with the grid array on the sensor on the camera, and it, it ends up looking not so great. Some of the better higher end cameras have some filtering going on inside the camera that prevents that. But this Sony camera, it doesn't quite do that. So anyhow, there we are. So Tabworks made by Xerox Corporation. And when this loaded up, it said exclusively for Compaq. So, this is actually replacing Program Manager entirely on this computer. So you would use this to load up all your programs and it looks like you can have files as well. I assume these are files here and I guess this is organized into these sort of tabs. So uh, actually this is the contents. Sorry, it's hard to read this font here. Contents, quick and two, we have the tab works, which is what we're using here. Power management utilities, which is a compact thing. Let's just run that. What are we? Okay, this just lets us set the time and power off for the monitor and the hard drive. Those are also settings we could see in the BIOS. But it's nice there's a Windows utility to expose that. We have the easy online help utility, which takes us out of Windows and into sort of this fake Windows graphical OS here. Uh, mouse trackball operations. Okay, so a little help suite here from Compaq. Let's exit out of this, go back to Windows. Security management, I assume, is a power on password. Yes, it is. Very nice. Disable diskette boot drive ability. So it's kind of cool. Disable serial and parallel. Allows you to manipulate some of the BIOS settings also right from in Windows. Okay, so next up, America Online, and there is no icon for it. So I wonder if that means it's not working. We have the good old Minesweeper and Solitaire. I mean, it goes without saying, right? Okay, whoever played on this computer was a good player. Oops, okay, so I'm just, I personally love Minesweeper. I'm just trying to get started here. They have their settings turned up pretty high. So if you're not familiar with Minesweeper, it's a pretty fun game. You can find a version on this on everything, but it's all about identifying all the mines by looking at these numbers. You flag where you think there are bombs, like there, there, and there, and you have to use these numbers to tell you that like this square here is facing or touching two bombs. So there are four potential squares that there could be a bomb. Anyhow, that's Minesweeper, fun game, good old solitaire. I mean, these are the two Windows apps, right? That basically how much productivity was lost to these types of apps, right? Uh, an incredible, incredible amount. We have the control panel. Let's just poke a quick look in there and check out the drivers. Let's see what we got going for the, the video driver. Uh, okay, I guess nothing actually. 
Looks like we have a copy of Prodigy on here. Let's run this. Oh, it's a DOS program. Let's see what this does. All right, okay, Prodigy. Now I remember trying Prodigy out very briefly. Now this was an online service online as in it called into it with a modem. And the thing that this had over say a regular BBS is it used this graphics description language, so to speak. So when you went onto this service, as you did stuff in here, it was graphical. So it wasn't just text, entirely text over black background or colorful text or whatever. It literally could draw graphics. And when I launched this, you notice that it drew this product Prodigy logo and this kind of star in the background on these boxes. That is all something that Prodigy could do. And it was, it was a pretty cool service and it has mouse support. And you know, you type your ID and blah, blah, blah. And now let's click view highlights. I don't know if this is gonna even work. Uh, your sign in was not correct. Yes, well, of course. I'm assuming the way this works is you need to sign in and click one of these buttons and then it takes you to this guide. But as you notice, yes, like this is the way it had little graphical windows and stuff. It was all pretty neat. Let's, let's click setup. Maybe we can see a little bit of what it can do working. So there it is, like there's a pop-up dialog box and Prodigy could do this. This is like before the web. This was entirely modem based and it was a very compressed graphical markup language. I guess that's what you can call it, right? So it was pretty fast, even over something like a 2400 baud modem. So we have a phone number and there's a modem speed. So 2400 baud, like I said, but it wasn't terribly slow because Prodigy was quite efficient. Let's see, there's a help button here. Let's click that, see what we get on for help. Working. It's, maybe it's trying to dial up to Prodigy. We have detected a problem with your software. All right, well, I guess that's the end of that. <laughs> Back to Windows. All right, we have something called Juno, which I'm assuming is a game. Not familiar with it off the top of my head. It's still launching. This thing kind of chugs a little bit. This hard drive is probably relatively slow. Just replacing it with a compact flash is gonna certainly speed it up dramatically. Juno, that's actually email, <laughs> not a game. Okay, I closed out of that because it actually popped up with a person's username, whoever owned this computer before, and I'm not gonna show any personal information on what's on this computer. In fact, I'm probably gonna go through here and do a bit of a purging to get rid of all the personal information on here. I'd like to preserve this copy of Windows 3.1 since this is the correct one to run on this particular machine, came from Compact this way. But uh, yeah, I'm gonna purge out all the personal info. So we have a program here called PFS Window Works version two. I am assuming, developed by Spinnaker, that this is a word processor of some type, and sure enough, it is. It's got an address book, database, so it's like a Microsoft Works type program, but made by PFS, which was pretty big in the, that space for a long time. There it is, PFS Windows Works version 2.01. Neat. And I do have to talk about how Windows 3.1, while, yeah, it wasn't a real multitasking operating system, it was just a shell on top of DOS, it really, it made using computers so much easier for the general user. Imagine trying to navigate DOS as a person who just wants to do some word processing, things like that. The graphical user interface that's here is, is just such a huge leap for PCs. And of course, Macintoshes have had this type of nice interaction all the way back to the very first Macintosh 128, right? But, but Windows really started to kind of become usable within Windows 3.1. I mean, people can argue that the earlier versions did too, but really it just exploded in popularity with 3.1, which is what we're using here. We have some compact utilities here. We have something called the Control Center. So we have the Learning Center, the Computer Checkup, the Computer Setup, Exit to Windows. We have Power Manager, which we already saw, Security Manager, which we already saw, and the Welcome Center. Let's check the Welcome Center. Ooh. This is the same thing we were literally just in. All right, so let's check out the Learning Center. Our README, the User Guide, Learning Adventure. <laughs> let's just check this out. Is this some kind of silly game or something? Login? What? Okay, I'm just gonna click through. There's a login box at the top here. Dr. Techno and the search for the brigands of the South Seas. Please type in your initials. Uh, okay, let's do that, A, B. Hey, wait a second, I just noticed something that the color palette changed. So maybe this is running in 256 color mode and I was looking erroneously in the driver section. People were probably screaming at their screen saying, that's not the right place, so okay. Welcome to the Compact Presario Learning Adventure. 
Before you use this, you need to know how to use your mouse. Well, yes, it says run a Windows tutorial. Easy, fun, less text, more fun. All right, so it wants us to select the book. I'm gonna, they all, they all look really boring, ABC. I'm gonna pick this one with a palm tree and a wave on it. I mean, that's certainly the most fun. Oh, this thing is really slow. Click anywhere to continue, all right. Give us something fun. I think four megabytes of RAM is really too little. The hard drive is sort of thrashing, which probably implies it's swapping. Sailing to the Silicon Islands seems to be sort of like a little adventure game. I suppose it's kind of cute. I'm wondering now if I have viewers who went through this tutorial on their compact Persario. This probably was installed on all sorts of machines with Windows 3.1 at the time. So yeah, this seems to be a little, you can navigate around and uh, it's a little bit of an adventure. <laughs> How funny. All right, well, is it kind of giving us a tutorial on how to use Windows? Okay, I think I'm gonna exit out of this thing. Can I just click this button here to exit? Doesn't appear so. How about the good old Alt F4 on the keyboard? Oh, it's giving us the beeps. <laughs> What's happening? So much thrashing. Okay, I finally exited out of that. Let's keep going down. Oh, we have a game pack. The semantic game pack, semantic game pack. <laughs> All right. We have code breaker, hangman, jacks, memory blocks, pickup sticks, and smart dots. I have a feeling these are probably rather crappy games. All right, well, we have code breaker here. So let's say new game. Uh, I'm not sure what I need to even do. Oh, I see, I think. No, I don't actually see. There's a scroll bar here, one through five. I'll just read the help here. The computer randomly generates a secret code of a selected length using the enabled symbols. Enter a guess of what the code might be by clicking on the symbols to the left. The white cursor box can be moved by clicking on the new location. Okay, All right, bus will erase, okay. When you are done, press done. You are given two clues about the guess. Black pluses indicate correct symbols in the correct position, and a white check mark indicates the correct symbols but in the wrong position. All right, uh, done, right down here, okay. I guess I got nothing right there. Okay, so white check marks, I already forgot what that means. <laughs> Let's go back. Black check mark means the correct symbol is in the correct position. A white check mark means I have the correct symbol but in the wrong position. So how do I fix this? So let's just try the same thing again. Hit done, no change. There's gotta be some like method to the madness. Okay, so plus means that somewhere in here is correct. So it's gotta be, this is correct. The uh, this sort of teal color circle. This is definitely completely riveting, absolutely riveting content I'm making right here. Like this is gonna push me up to a million subscribers watching me play code breakers. All right, well, anyways, I got three pluses. So obviously there's um, one more symbol that's wrong. So yeah, that's, that could be fun actually. A little bit of a logic game, sure. I'm gonna skip over Hangman because it's probably super boring. Oh, this is junky. This is like a, you're supposed to throw the ball. You did not grab enough jacks. Okay, so. So while the ball is going through the air, you're supposed to grab these. It's like a mouse dexterity thing. This is the most exciting content anyone has ever seen. I mean, like, let's play. Whoa, oh, okay, so I, I'm pretty much terrible. Okay, exit out of this. All right, let's keep going down and see what's on this computer. Okay, we have all the regular Windows 3.1 pieces of software here. And the last thing on here is MassFax, which is a fax piece of fax software for sending faxes. Ah, so there we go. That's the sort of programmer manager replacement. If I click on Quicken, there is Quicken. I'm not gonna run that because if there may be personal information in there, probably certainly is. And we can go to games and okay, well, unfortunately it's not showing us all the games, just those two. These are probably what were the folders in the regular program manager, I'd imagine. Yeah, here's a semantic game tab. So there are those semantic games. So this is just a pretty friendly way to represent all your programs. All right, what I wanted to run is file manager. Let's just, let's give a little poke around the hard drives. Let's see if we see anything other than the programs that we've already looked at. Compact DOS, 
Aha, we have something called Star Trek. Let's run that. Is this the old text Star Trek game? Hey, no! We have... Oh boy. Am I gonna get a copyright strike? <laughs> for that, for this Star Trek music. Look at that VGA graphics though. Demon World. So this was a game that I never played, but hey, this is a pretty cool Captain's Log. All right, so Star Trek, the original series here, Lieutenant Uhura, nice 250 color graphics. Is that supposed to be the red alert sound? It's so junky. Maybe this supports Sound Blaster, which I'm gonna have to add to this thing. All right, let's exit out of here. I hit Alt-Tab. And that went right back into Windows. Sweet. Well, I'm rebooting the Presario here. Oh, I don't want to boot into Windows. Please exit. Oh, okay. Well, I was trying to get to DOS. I'm going to run scan disk and stuff on here. I think it's time to start doing some upgrades to this thing. It needs a little TLC. It needs a little spruce. A little more from RAM, a little faster CPU, if possible. Better hard drive, things like that, because I love this computer. This thing is cool. I just love the form factor. It's it is heavy. I didn't mention that earlier. It's pretty heavy. It's built really well, as a compact would be. But it's just neat how it's just all in one. It's just, I could break it out, have a 46 to use, put it away when I'm done without taking up too much space. Okay, I didn't realize this, that Docs DOS 6.0 has no scan disk. So I guess we're going to use check disk slash F just to make sure the hard drive is good. And yes, right away we found some issues. So I'm just going to run through this and then I'm going to copy the hard drive. Oh boy, we have some other issues, we have lost chains and clusters and things like that. Do we want to convert these chains to clusters? Uh, the good old fat file system, it's been around a long time, but it is easily corruptible. And hopefully, uh, look, Juno got corrupted. Oh well, whatever, so that's how it happens. Luckily, I don't need Juno anyways, right? So anyhow, okay, time to start the upgrade process. Yes, just turn that off, I love it. Well, I'm gonna end the Compact Persario video right here. We took a look at all the stuff that's on the hard drive and what's inside this machine. And in part two, I will actually do all the upgrades and get this thing working as well as it can or as fast as it can. I'd really like to thank all my patrons who have already signed up to become a patron for my channel. I really, really appreciate it. If you wanna do that, there'll be a link in the description below. And that's going to be it for this video. If you liked it, I'd appreciate a thumbs up. But if you didn't, you know, to do all that YouTube stuff, comments in the comment section below, subscribe, etc., etc. And that's going to be it. Stay healthy, stay safe, and I'll see you next time. Goodbye.